Thank you for listening to Depictions Media Radio. All right, welcome back. Um, we're go- about to listen to um, the director of the Pan American Health Organization, Carissa uh, Etienne. And Dr. Etienne is wanting to highlight the devastating effects that the pandemic has had on women, both economically as well as um, health wise. Um, that there have been a lot of a lot of things that that to have actually affected up to twenty million women in the Americas, um, as far as things like things to do with with health and social um, social and mental health for for women, as well as. There are countries in um, in the Americas that are, as far as their vaccination programs are concerned, that are very far behind um, the U.S. and Canada. And there's going to take a lot of work to get them caught up to be at the same level that um, the United States and Canada have have achieved as far as vaccinations. And that needs to be addressed so that the entire world can be safe from the pandemic. So let's listen to what Dr. Etienne, uh, along with Dr. Barbosa, as they answer questions from uh, both North and South America about what is actually happening in the pandemic on uh, the Western Hemisphere of the world. Thank you for joining today's press briefing. Over 1.2 million new COVID cases and 31,000. These figures have changed over the last underscoring a worrying trend. Cases and towing at an alarmingly. In fact, last week, out of five of the countries, the of new infections were here in our region. And countries represented the top five highest rates worldwide. Trinidad and Tobago has declared a national emergency following recent COVID. In the meantime, Cuba continues to report significant infections. St. Vincent and the Grenadines are still seeing spikes and eruptions resulted in people being moved to shelters. We are also concerned about increasing trends in hospitalization. Central American countries are also reporting spikes, including Costa Rica, Panama, Belize, and in Honduras, where are over 80% capacity. In South America, Chile, Peru, and Paraguay have registered declines in new infections. However, Uruguay and Argentina are again seeing COVID infections are several weeks of progress at risk. Bolivia is increasing cases and deaths the highest number of cases and deaths since the beginning of the pandemic. Five persistently high infections cases are no longer adhering to the public health measures, which we know are COVID-19. And new figures suggest that we may not yet know this pandemic. WHO announced that COVID deaths are being significantly undercounted. According to many more complications, 
or from pandemics indirect impacts like disruptions to essential services that have put their health at risk. Although more than 3.4 million since the pandemic started, almost half of this in the Americas. The real numbers may be higher. For 2020, deaths stood at 1.8 million, but COVID's true global 2020 deaths now estimated at closer to last year. Worryingly, half of these deaths have occurred here in the Americas, demonstrating the oversized, outsized impact that this pandemic has had in our region. I wish to spotlight the devastating health, social, and economic impact this virus has had on women. The world, women make up 70 workforce across Latin America and the Caribbean. And much of the burden of our COVID. And it is women who are feeling the economic impact of this virus the hardest. In our region, women are more likely than men to live in poverty to take on unpaid work and to have lost their job during the pandemic's first month. Right now, many Latin American women are facing the impossible choice between earning a paycheck and protecting their health. And for too many, healthcare remains out of reach. Unfortunately, as health systems have prioritized care for COVID patients, hospitals and clinics have struggled to provide essential health services that women depend on for their health and well being. According to UN estimates, up to 20 million women in the Americas will have their birth control disrupted during the pandemic, either because services are unavailable or because women will no longer have the means to pay for contraception. But it is not just contraceptive services which are being impacted. Pregnancy and newborn care have been disrupted in nearly half of the countries in the Americas, leaving expectant and new mothers at risk. If this continues, the pandemic is expected to obliterate more than 20 years of progress in expanding women's access to family planning and tackling maternal deaths in the region. Nearly all maternal deaths are preventable and even getting back to pre-pandemic levels of maternal mortality, which were already high, could take more than a decade. We should take a minute to talk about what this means for pregnant women, some of whom may be going through the entire pregnancies without being seen by a doctor at a time when care couldn't be more critical. Like all of us, pregnant women are exposed to COVID-19 infections. But because their immune systems change throughout their pregnancies, pregnant women are more vulnerable to respiratory infections like COVID-19. Once they get sick, they also tend to develop more serious symptoms that require intubation and which can often put the baby and mother at risk. Data from 24 countries indicates that more than 200,000 pregnant women have fallen sick with COVID in the Americas and at least a thousand have died from COVID complications. The risk of death also depends on where you look. While pregnant women have less than a 1% chance of dying from COVID in Argentina, Costa Rica, and Colombia, 
The risk of death in Honduras jumps to 5%, and the risk remains highest in Brazil at 7%. So as we commemorate this week's International Day of Action on Women's Health, we urge countries to do just that, to act. The evidence is clear that pregnant women are at higher risk for severe disease and hospitalization due to infection with SARS-CoV-2. So we can start by ensuring that women and girls can access the health services that they need, like sexual and reproductive health services and pregnancy and newborn related care during the COVID response. We must remember that the challenges and inequities that we faced prior to COVID-19 have not gone away during the pandemic. In fact, They've only worsened, and we cannot overlook them. That's why we must make protecting the lives of women a collective priority. Thank you, and over. Thank you, Dr. Etienne. Muchas gracias, Dr. Etienne. Thank you, Dr. Etienne. Now we're going to um, answer the questions that have been sent by email and which have been sent also through the Q&A. I remind you, please always include your names and media uh, when you send your questions. First question is from Mariana Vieira from Metropolis in Brazil, and she asks in English. And WHO position on vaccine for pregnant women. Uh, do you recommend it? Is AstraZeneca safe for pregnant women, Dr. Etienne? Thanks for this important question uh, coming right after these remarks because pregnant women around the world are facing a great deal of uncertainty. But as I outline in today's remarks, the evidence is clear that pregnant women are more vulnerable to respiratory infections like COVID-19. The data also shows that compared to non-pregnant women, Expectant mothers have a higher risk of developing serious COVID symptoms and require hospitalization and intubation, which often puts the baby and mother at risk, as we said earlier. While this much we know, the data on COVID vaccinations is much more limited. And for this reason, the WHO Strategic Advisory Group of Experts on immunization, better known as SAGE, has reviewed the available data on the five vaccines that have received emergency use authorization by the WHO, namely Pfizer, Moderna, Janssen, AstraZeneca, and the Sinopharm vaccines. And the SAGE group deemed that there is not yet enough evidence to recommend COVID-19 vaccines for all pregnant women, but they have recommended that pregnant and lactating women can be offered one of the five WHO authorized COVID-19 vaccines when the benefits of vaccination outweigh the potential risks. And, and that's why we encourage pregnant and lactating women in the high risk groups, such as healthcare workers, or those with comorbidities, to please talk to uh, their healthcare providers about the risk and the benefits of getting um, vaccinated. Clinical trials and analysis of real life vaccination are also underway to assess the safety and the efficacy of COVID vaccines among healthy pregnant women, and that will continue to inform the SAGE group's recommendations. In the meantime, it is very important that pregnant and lactating women keep up the public health measures that we know are effective against the virus. This includes wearing masks, maintaining social distance, limiting contact with individuals living outside of their households, and avoiding closed spaces with no ventilation, and indoor gatherings, which are especially important to keep mothers and their babies safe from COVID. 
Gracias, eh, doctora Etienne. Eh, siguiente pregunta es de... Thank you, Dr. Etienne. Next question comes from Michelle Marchante from the Miami Herald in English as well. And she asks... Pandemic. Health experts like Dr. Fauci says the COVID will likely be controlled, not eradicated. If this is the case, what is the criteria WHO will use to decide if the global COVID-19 pandemic is over? What percentage of the world would need to be vaccinated? Or what would be the maximum of new cases globally considered to meet this criteria? Dr. Barbosa? Thank you for this question. <clears throat> we have many uncertainties about what will happen in one year because what, what the, how the world will be in one year is very related with the access to vaccines, for instance, that we have now many, a, a very limited access for many countries. First, I, I agree with Dr. Fauci that we are not talking about eradication of COVID-19 in one year. Eradication is when we have eliminated completely a disease such as smallpox and nobody needs to take a vaccine anymore against smallpox and the countries don't have to, <clears throat> to perform surveillance on smallpox. The control is different. <clears throat> control is when you have a transmission that in, is in a low level that <clears throat> cannot disrupt the society, that cannot cause any uh, important harm to the life to the societies and to the health. We, of course, that we hope that in one year we have this pandemic control, but again, this is very related with the equitable access for every country in the world to the vaccines that they need. We don't know yet what is the, the, the immunization coverage level that we need to control the, the transmission, but some estimation Uh, said that you need at least 70 or 80 percent. So with this level, to, to reach this level uh, is the main object that we have now. And the, for, with this kind of commitment uh, in, in the whole world, we can uh, have in one year at least the transmission control and the society is coming to, to their regular life again. Thank you. Gracias, doctor. La próxima pregunta Thank este. you, doctor. Next question is from Victoria Daneman from Doce Welle, and it says that in Chile there will be a mobility pass that will allow people who have been vaccinated with two doses to uh, move around without restrictions. And she wants to know whether the the if you Pajo recommends this type of pass, uh, Dr. Ogarte, thank you very much for your question. It applies to many other countries where the population is receiving two doses and um, the countries are taking measures uh, to flexibilize or open up their society for people who have been fully vaccinated. Pajo is aware of the measure adopted by Chile and as part of a technical cooperation related to the pandemic. Uh, some considerations have been shared regarding this measure. In principle, we consider that this measure may have Uh, a positive impact. It's reasonable from the standpoint of epidemiological analyses for the people who are protected, and it should also take into account some important aspects, such as, for example, the equi equivalence, uh, uh, um, uh, equitable access, uh, and uh, it, it would all be related to the passes that people would be given when they have been vaccinated. And this would include uh, people living in urban areas who receive their pass and the, who have been vaccinated. But also, it should also be applied to people who are in rural areas of lower resources, uh, to indigenous populations, to migrants, who are other populations or sets of the population who are in uh, uh, under conditions or, or who are um, 
eligible to receive the vaccines and they also uh, should be giving those passes in order that they can begin their economic recovery and we should also look into other alternatives uh, people who due to health reasons cannot receive the vaccines then the uh, chile vaccine strategy has been successful and if we include other reasons why uh, the population is receiving vaccinations it is also at the same time necessary to remind the population that it, it, it the public health measures must be maintained and they are as important as the mobility passes it's very important and chile has seen this situation so the public health measures that are being implemented simultaneously regarding uh, restriction of movement for non-vaccinated people restricting uh, community transmission possibilities, etc. All the other public health measures need to be implemented because we are not yet beyond the possibility of transmission. So transmission is still possible. So yes, this measure is supported by the independent uh, uh, advisory uh, board but there's some concern uh, that not all populations, not all work areas could uh, represent a decreased risk. However, this is a measure that has to be adapted as it is implemented in Chile. And this is in contrast to what has happened in other countries where the measures adopted, for example, for populations who are fully protected are um, in general, but there's no way in which it can be uh, confirmed whether a person has been fully vaccinated or not when they are in situations where they are in closer contact with other people. In other words, when um, people can say, uh, yes, I'm vaccinated, but how can you prove it? So, uh, yes, thank you. Thank you, doctor. Next question. It has to do with vaccine and it's from Daniel Colling from TN23 uh, uh, in Guatemala and someone from Mexico. Uh, Mr. Colin says authorities in the Guatemalan government continue to mention the delay uh, in the COVAX facility to deliver vaccines in particular because the neighboring country, in this case El Salvador, received a new batch. So what is the timeline for the deliveries? Uh, Ms. Ochoa from Mexico says that uh, um, Pajo said that starting in June, they they will be providing up to 70% of the uh, doses that were uh, committed through COVAX. Is the, will this uh, be uh, complied with, Dr. Barbosa? Yes, thank you for your two questions. F first, answering the second question. In um, the second half of the year, we will have broader access to the vaccines. The estimate was that 30% would be delivered during the first half of the year, and the uh, the rest, the 70%, uh, would deliver it in the second half. COVAX is facing difficulties right now because the Serum Institute of India, which is one of the great providers of COVAX, of um, providers for COVAX, is in negotiations with the government of India in, for the delivery of the doses um, that the Indian government committed to provide to COVAX. We hope that with the new manufacturers such as uh, Janssen, Pfizer, Moderna, Sinopharm, uh, then will provide greater access during the second half of the year. Regarding Guatemala, Guatemala is currently in the process of sending, the, the country needs to send a confirmation of their agreement with the payment estimated for the 361,000 doses of AstraZeneca they're going to receive when the country then confirms and makes payment uh, within two weeks after that, the countries will, uh, the uh, vaccines will arrive in the country. And there is also uh, an, another um, 
batch of doses from Pfizer, which will be arriving in June. Uh, not all countries can receive their vaccines at the same time. It's impossible to send everything at the same time uh, for all countries. So COVAX developed an algorithm, an algorithm which is totally random, and it randomizes the list of countries. And we follow that list. At the end of all the rounds of deliveries, the countries are going to receive the same proportion of uh, doses. So there is no privilege here or no favored country. Uh, no, it, it, there has been a, a, an independent committee of international expert based in W in Geneva uh, who go over these criteria of equitable distribution among the population. So Guatemala is there ready to receive the vaccines and we're working with the government uh, and with the manufacturers so that the doses can arrive in the country as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. Next question. So also from Evan Joan regarding the variants. Uh, Aaron's there has been misinformation spreading online globally claiming that the COVID-19 vaccines create new variants of the virus. Uh, what do you think about these claims? Y la siguiente pregunta es de Anthony Boal. Next de... question is from Reuters in Brasilia, and it's also in English. Concerns about the arrival of the Indian variant in Brazil and its possible impact in the region. Dr. Aldigieri. Uh, thank you for these two uh, quite different questions. Regarding uh, COVID-19 vaccines and variants, uh, first, it's important to mention that the emergence of variants is a biological process driven by the intense transmission and the replication of the virus. Vaccines themselves are not complete viruses or are not composed by viruses uh, uh, and are composed by viruses with no capacity to replicate. So they cannot evolve to become variants. On the other end, it is possible that after some time, the viruses change to partially avoid the immune response generated by the vaccine. This is a natural process that we know that also occurs with other viruses, including the influenza virus. Therefore, it is possible that the vaccines would need to be updated in a year or two. Nevertheless, the existing licensed vaccines have demonstrated protection against the variants of concern and the variants of interest that are circulating at global level. Now, the second question regarding the uh, variant uh, initially detected in India, the B1617 lineage. In the power region, as of early this week, this variant slash lineage has been detected in 10 countries from North America, South America, Central America and the Caribbean. Most of these detections were associated to international travelers. Nevertheless, as of this week, no sustained or community transmission has been associated with this B1617 lineage. I hope I have covered both questions. Thank you. Gracias, doctor. Uh, Thank you, doctor. The next question is by Rosemary Bernal from the Prensa Latina. She's saying, how does PAHO assess progress made by the five vaccine candidates against COVID-19 developed by Cuba, out of which two, Soberana 02 and Abdala, are undergoing phase three of clinical trials based on their 
efficacy assessment. The clinical trials and studies developed so far with these two candidate vaccines have shown safety and immunogenicity, and if their efficacy was shown and also their emergency use was authorized, how do Q how us uh, Cuban researchers expect would PAHO recommend including these products in the COVAX facility? Dr. Barbosa, thank you for this question. It is very important to have candidate vaccines in the region. This is a question that PAHO is always addressing how we can better work with the countries in coordination, not only the ministries of health, but also the ministries of economy or industry and trade so that we can strengthen the productive capacity for vaccines in the region and also reduce the vulnerability in the region. I think that this is an important challenge and this is going to be a mid to long term project for the countries in the region to have as a very important priority. So all of the challenges are welcome. I think it is very important to recognize the efforts made by the countries to develop vaccines. All of the vaccines need to comply with the same criteria, the same methodology. Vaccines first need to be tested at the lab level to have information on their capacity capability to produce antibodies, and then the clinical trials start with a small group of uh, healthy volunteers to be able to confirm that the vaccine is safe, and then it moves on to phase two that includes a larger group and also to confirm the safety and efficacy in the production of antibodies, and then this moves to phase three. Phase three is compulsory. Without information from phase three, it is not feasible to ascertain whether a vaccine or candidate vaccine is safe and whether it can produce protection. That information is only obtained upon conclusion of phase three. After conclusion of phase three, vaccines are presented to be licensed by the national authorities. And if the vaccine is interested in participating in the COVAX facility, it has to be authorized for emergency use by WHO. Once all of that cycle is completed, the vaccine is ready to be considered by COVAX. So I think that at this point in time, it is important to develop the vaccine in Cuba, but we also need to wait for the completion of phase three, the same as with the other vaccines. We are not interested in the nationality of the vaccine. They are all welcome. The more vaccines we have, the better it is for the population because they will have better access. But the criteria are applied for to all of the vaccines, regardless of the area of production. So we hope to conclude the studies and also for them to be properly done to have and with proper results result to have more vaccines. But we need to wait as we're waiting for the other vaccines, publication of the data in uh, the in journals, in scientific journals and also the regulations by uh, the decisions by WHO authorities. Thank you. The next questions are related to the schools. And this this question by sent by Nelsia Charlemagne from Choice TV in St. Lucia and Melina Ochoa from Uno TV in Mexico in English. COVID-19 and should students be returning to face-to-face -to -face learning at this time? Uh, this is a question from Nelsia uh, Charlemagne in St. Lucia. Y Melina Ochoa in Mexico uh, pregunta similar. Melina Ochoa in question is asking a similar question and I will be reading it in English. Return to face-to-face -face classes in June in Mexico could provoke a resurgence of the virus. Doctor Ugarte, podría contestar. Yes, thank you for for both questions. In the context of the of the pandemic, uh, personal protection, physical distancing, and hand hygiene has been uh, included as the core of the of the protection, including, of course, use of masks. 
And as for any other uh, daily life activity, schools play an important role, implying that there, uh, all these measures are implemented also at schools. Uh, for instance, operating at reduced capacity through the, uh, and through the combination of remote and face-to-face -face didactic uh, activities, and also some other environmental measures uh, that should be well defined and, uh, in protocols and implemented by the education authorities and the local authorities, and of course, those responsible for each educational uh, uh, facility and in close collaboration, of course, with the, uh, the supervision of the health authorities in the area. In the context of intense SARS-CoV-2 uh, or COVID-19 transmission, uh, the reopening of schools should be uh, considered taking into account uh, also other community-wide measures. It is important to consider the transmission of the virus in those areas and to implement the reopening of schools, including face-to-face -face classes, as we implement also the other measures. It, wouldn't, it won't be a surprise, as the uh, Under Secretary of Health of Mexico mentioned, that after reopening schools, some cases may increase, the number of cases may increase. It is just a, a, a situation where the transportation during the 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 movement of the of the students but also teachers uh, and others that are not necessarily uh, fully vaccinated may also increase the the transmission but this is a, a measure that also has to be taken into consideration that long period of time when schools were closed and that has been affected particularly the population with less resources and the population that cannot afford uh having uh, like for example uh, online classes so this is a, an, a another ethical decision that must be taken into consideration also i would like to to highlight that these decisions both uh, in uh, in mexico but uh, but, but also in saint lucia uh, are part of the general response and reopening of the economy and this must be taken into account with other community-wide measures, as I, as I mentioned. It is important to uh, also include the teachers uh, in the uh, prioritization of the immunization uh, groups as we also reopen schools, as it has if the vaccine is available after the other priority groups, as, as we know. Thank you. Gracias, Dr. Ugarte. Eh, siguientes preguntas Thank vienen. you, Dr. Ugarte. The following question is by Gisela Salomón from AP and also Alina Diestre from AFP. Gisela says, what, how can you explain the deterioration of the situation in Argentina and Uruguay? What are your recommendations? What information do you have? And also, Selena Diestre, what is PAHO's assessment of the situation in the southern cone and she includes paraguay uruguay and argentina and why cases and uh, death number of deaths continue to increase in these countries thank you dr aldeguiri i will try to combine the answer to A afp and ap for the first four months of 2021 we have observed a concerning evolution of the COVID-19 situation in all of the Southern Cone countries, including the states in the Southern area of Brazil, Paraguay, Chile, Uruguay, and Argentina. But it is important to mention that the Southern Cone countries are not at the same time of the epidemic of the pandemic in Chile, we see a gradual decrease of new cases following also a strict implementation of public health measures. The burden on 
the services for ICU patients and severe patients continues to be high, very high in most of the Southern Cone countries. Clearly, there is a combination, a complex combination of several factors from the epidemiological point of view. However, the sequence of high movement of population during Christmas, Carnival, Holy Week, in a context of very limited application of public health measures, clearly contributed to this deterioration during the summer in the south. In the case of Argentina, there is a clear higher incidence among young adults between 20 and 59 years of age with a higher concentration in the 30 to 39 years of age. That could be associated to their greater mobility, the greater mobility of this group. And also this added to the exhaustion and also the tiredness of these uh, uh, lo of the lockdown measures and also the use of uh, facial masks. In the case of Uruguay, the increase of these uh, trends had an exponential increase in the month of March. In April, the country showed also a very high number of daily cases. More than 92,000 individuals were diagnosed with COVID-19 during this period. Now, our main concern is the beginning of winter in the south and historically in the southern cone countries has coincided with the season for acute respiratory diseases such as influenza and the synthesial respiratory virus. So in this case, the strict implementation and the strict monitoring of public health measures in the southern cone is once again at the center of res the response and control of COVID-19 in that part of the world. I hope I have addressed AP and AFP questions. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. The following question is by Tobias Kaufer, Latin American correspondent, and he's saying, what is the impact of a rapid vaccination campaign to stop coronavirus ca cases in Argentina. The vaccine may be used, may be used with different goals in mind. So far, there is uh, no experience of using the vaccine to reduce transmission immediately. The countries are using the vaccine first to maintain health services and also the other social essential services working by vaccinating health professionals and health workers and also frontline workers. Second, the goal behind the vaccine is to save lives and the recommendation is to vaccinate the elderly and also adults that have some sort of chronic disease that may imply a risk, well-known risk factor for severe forms of COVID-19. That is the goal of the vaccine and that may take months. Even if complete vaccination is attained with all of these priority groups, the measures that may work and that we know work for the immediate decrease of the pace of transmission and also for the number of cases to diminish faster are the public health measures such as the use of masks and also social distancing among individuals, the avoidance of enclosed spaces, crowds, and also depending on the situation in each country, the measures that the countries may implement to diminish the morbidity of individuals. This has worked in countries of Latin America, Europe, even in the US, because these are immediate measures that together with others, such as 
proper access to testing to determine those that actually have the virus, that package of measures may have an immediate impact because they are measures that can be properly implemented with the support of the population and that also has the ability to diminish transmission as vaccination continues to grow to protect the most vulnerable individuals and to save lives. Thank you. The following question by Noel Perez Miranda from Articulo 66 in Nicaragua. She's saying that last week, based on the last report by the Ministry of Health of Nicaragua, there were 91 cases of COVID-19 transmission, but we continued to, they continued to report one death per week. On the other hand, citizens, the Citizens Observatory is uh, providing data that triples those figures. How does PAHO verify the data that is provided by the health institution in the country? And finally, with the PAHO has already provided all of the COVID-19 vaccine doses to Nicaragua, or if there is a lot that is still missing. Dr. Ugarte, we, PAHO receives information based on the international health regulations. They, we receive reports that are brief with information that is not completely detailed, but it is through this channel under the international health regulations that PAHO requests additional information and interacts with the countries, such as in the case of Nicaragua in particular, by requesting additional information on the pandemic situation and also the impact it has on the population, including reports by other sources to be able to obtain confirmation of that information that is substantially different from the one presented in official data. The, la the latest information that we received is through a press release that indicates 131 cases and one death, as it was stated in the question. The country, in connection with the vaccine, has received 132,000 doses and Two shipments are outstanding that are expected to be received in two batches. One is for 81,000 doses to cover the allotment for this uh, quarter, for, for these two quarters, but we do know the limitations of the vaccine. In the case of, the, of Nicaragua, that vaccine is coming from India and thinking of, and if we think of the situation of con con transmission in India, it is COVAX, the COVAX facility that is working on additional shipments and Nicaragua will be appraised of the situation soon. Uh, some other countries are, are also receiving information in connection with other vaccines, but in the case of Nicaragua, this is the vaccine from India. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. The following questions are related to Haiti. And this is from Laura Strickler from NBC News National. And also from the Miami Herald. The question is. The hugely fluctuating case numbers from Haiti. Uh, Jacqueline Charles, también en inglés, dice, uh, can you talk about the trends in hospitalizations in Haiti and any confirmation or on when the country will receive its first vaccines? Is PAHO providing any assistance to help the country and any word on when vaccines will arrive? Uh, we have heard July and we've heard August, she says. Uh, Dr. Aldigieri, quizás podría comenzar. Dr. Aldigieri, could you please start it? I will start with the two first sets of questions. And after uh, Dr. Barbosa, I think, would follow on the vaccine aspect. The, uh, the COVID-19 data available for IET on the PAO website is the data reported by the country um, Ministry of Health, MSPP, uh, Ministère de la Santé Publique et de la Population. On some days, data has been reported late by the country or not at all. When this occurs, it appears on the website as zero cases or zero death. 
This does not necessarily mean that there were no cases, only that no cases were reported on that specific day. This explains the fluctuation in numbers. So regarding the question from Ms. Charles, and uh, I'd like to flag again the concerns of uh, Pan American Health Organization regarding the evolution of the epidemiological situation in Haiti uh, during the last weeks. As our director, Dr. Etienne, said during her remarks today, we are concerned about increasing trends in hospitalizations in Haiti. Cases are rising, especially in Port-au-Prince. Hospitals are getting stretched. It is also important to note the detection of two variants of concern by the National uh, Reference Laboratory. In this context, the government of Haiti has imposed a nightly curfew and other measures last Monday under an eight-day health emergency declaration with the objective to curb the spread of the coronavirus. But it's also important to note that the Ministry of Health and other national partners as the Centre Gesquio and other NGOs as Zanmi La Santé have expanded dramatically the laboratory testing capacities during the last month, including with the assistant of our office in Port Prince. However, the the period of political instability and the low perception of the risk in the population during the past months may have impacted negatively on control activities and also on the surveillance uh, of SARS-CoV-2 uh, circulation. So I hope that I have answered uh, the two first sets of questions and I would like to give the floor to our assistant director, Dr. Barbosa. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvain. About the vaccines, we received the information from the government of Haiti last week that they, they want to receive the, the vaccines through COVAX. So uh, they, they, we are working with the Ministry of Health and the government of Haiti to finalize all the administrative procedures that they need to to, to adopt in order to receive the 130,000 doses that the, uh, Haiti is entitled to receive as the first deployment, the first wave of deployment from COVAX. Uh, Haiti is one of the 10 countries in the region that uh, doesn't need to pay for the vaccines. They are receiving the vaccines uh, free of charge because they are supported by the donations that were made to COVAX, but they need to, to adopt adopt some administrative measures in order to certify that they are ready to receive the vaccines and to use. At this moment, we cannot confirm exactly the date, but we are trying to get the vaccines in June. But we only will have this uh, date when all these procedures are finalized and we receive the date and the flight from the producer. Thank you. Gracias a ambos. Siguiente pregunta. Thank you both. The following question is by Anthony Boadel from Reuters in English. Why do you think Mexico has so far avoided a, a third wave, given that it has been very permissive in terms of travel and business restrictions? Dr. Adigeri. Uh, thank you. But, uh, we, we have to take into account that Mexico has reported an important peak of transmission during the first month of 2021. This peak was recorded in January following the Christmas celebrations that have triggered less adherence by the population to the public health measures. So during the first quarter of 2021, more restricting uh, preventive measures, more strictly applicated preventive measures were taken associated with a very active risk communication activities. But we have also observed a slight 
a surge of cases in Mexico associated with the return of the Holy Week, Semana Santa vacations, and the uh, loosening of the corresponding preventive measures, including in tourism settings. Some states with high attendance during the Holy Week, such as Quintana Roo, Chihuahua, Baja California del Sur, and others, had shown an increase in cases. The federal authorities are taking actions. A delegation of the Ministry of Health has visited the state of Quintana Roo uh, during the last weeks to assess the implementation of public health measures at the point of entry, the airport settings, in the context of the international health regulations. And also, you have to take into account uh, the uh, vaccination campaign. Uh, the, the information uh, provided by the health authorities is that on uh, May uh, 25, 27 million doses have been administered uh, to the population of Mexico, uh, prioritizing health personnel, adults over 60 years of age, pregnant women, and patients with comorbidities. And also, in addition, uh, the vaccination for adults over 50 years has started uh, during the early um, period of May. So uh, this is uh, the context uh, of Mexico uh, at the moment. But again, you should take into account what happened earlier in 2021. Thank you. Gracias, doctor. La siguiente pregunta Thank you, doctor. The following question is by Judith Herrera from El Mercurio, Chile, who says, when would the approval of the vaccine by the Sinovac lab be ready, Coronavac, which is the main immunization being used in Chile? This is in connection with the need to have this approval by WHO which is demanded by the Union, European Union to be able to travel to European countries and for this vaccine in particular. Dr. Barbosa. Thank you for the question. The vaccines to be used through COVAX need to have that authorization for emergency use by WHO. This is a criterion that all of the vaccines need to meet, and the COVAX mechanism is clearly also giving the possibility to all of the producers to participate because the idea would be to cover the supply of vaccines for those countries that are participating. A China producer was approved for emergency use, and that was Sinopharm. This Sinovac. Sinovac is still to send information for the committee assessing all of the data related to the vaccines. WHO has a work process that includes experts and regulatory authorities from countries such as the European Agency, FDA from the US, and this is these are the the institutions that are carrying out the review process. Timing is usually related to the information that the producer has to provide to complete. So we have no date so far because oftentimes there is an assessment, there is a request for further information, something that was not properly defined in the studies. So we hope that we can do this as soon as possible, but with the time needed to have all of the information so that this the quality can be assessed as well as the safety of the vaccine. This is part of the process and we hope that a decision can be made in a couple of weeks, but um, we still do not have a final date. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. We are reaching the end of this uh, press briefing today, and we have several questions related to COVAX and also the provision of vaccines in the regions in English. On COVAX vaccine deliveries and donations to the Americas. Dr. Etienne. 
Let me thank you for this question. And, and you know, for the region of, of Latin America and the Caribbean, the access to vaccines is of, is of high importance. So we are happy to report that nearly 100,000 doses of AstraZeneca vaccines arrived in El Salvador yesterday. Another 140,000 doses of AstraZeneca and Pfizer vaccines are en route to Bolivia, Grenada, and St. Vincent and the Grenadines, where they should arrive in the next 24 hours. We are also pleased to hear that following the resolution of ongoing discussions, the first COVID-19 vaccines will be arriving in Haiti in the coming weeks, possibly June. These doses are desperately needed as Haiti is experiencing, as we said earlier, a rapid acceleration of cases and the authorities have announced a health emergency. But while we are pleased to see the arrival of more COVAX doses in our region, the reality is that we still face a glaring gap in access to vaccines. Countries in our region have consistently reported some of the highest weekly case counts and deaths. Our hospitals are full and and many patients are not getting the care that they desperately need. And yet in a region of nearly 700 million people, just 37 million have been fully vaccinated against COVID. You, I, I hope you agree that this is completely unacceptable and it demonstrates how long-standing inequities are being perpetuated by the slow COVID vaccine rollout. As wealthy countries expand vaccination, many of the most disproportionately impacted countries are being left behind. So we continue to urge the global community to help us expand vaccine coverage in the Americas. In the short term, as supplies are limited, vaccine donations offer us the best chance to fill immediate gaps. Spain has generously agreed to donate 5 million COVID-19 vaccine doses, that's about 5 to 10% of their total vaccine supply, to Latin America and the Caribbean. We are also very grateful to the government of Canada, which has committed 50 million Canadian dollars to support our work in expanding access to COVID vaccines in the region. And of course, we are encouraged by the US administration's pledge to donate 80 million doses to countries worldwide. So we hope that many of these are shared with its neighboring countries in Latin America and the Caribbean. In the coming months, as the global vaccine supply catches up with demand, we hope that manufacturers, donors, and countries remember the importance of equity. An equitable rollout calls for prioritizing people and placing at the highest risk and who are experiencing the greatest need, including here in the Americas. We believe that this is a moral imperative. However, in the meantime, let me remind you that the public health measures continue to be important to bringing this uh, this pandemic under some control and to protect lives and livelihoods. Please ensure um, adequate hand, frequent hand washing, physical uh, and, and social distancing, and also the wearing of masks. This is a uh, the intervention that is most available to us now, and it has proven that it is effective. So let us, and let me thank you again, and certainly we are in this together. Over. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias, Dr. Thank you very much, Dr. Etienne. Now we have reached the end of the session today, and let me remind you that you can find further information on COVID-19 on our webpage, www.paho.org slash coronavirus, including daily updated reports on the epidemiological situation in the region. Once again, thank you, and let's keep taking care of us. Thank you. This show has been produced by Depictions Media. 
please contact us at depictions.media for more information.